Good morning. It is so good to see you in person and online this morning. Welcome to Buck Hall Church. Grace and peace to you. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. A couple of things as we uh, prepare to enter into worship announcements for you, opportunities for you to engage. The first is that our August food pantry collection begins today, and we are collecting for the St. Thomas Food Pantry canned tomato products, green beans, and jelly. Now, somebody asked me why just jelly, and the reality is they told us they get plenty of peanut butter, but they don't get a lot of jelly. And as the kids prepare to go back to school, hard to believe that's just around the corner, but as they prepare to go back to school and families need things for sandwiches for their young ones, what they don't get is jelly. Uh, and so we're asking for jelly, green beans, and canned tomato products to collect throughout the month of August. Also, a thank you to everyone who joined us for our mission dinner on Tuesday night. Uh, in support of four children's sake. It was a wonderful time. We learned a lot about their mission and their ministry. If you want to know more about them, contact the office or look in the email. You can find a link for more information in there. And also stay tuned for our next mission dinner coming on in early in the fall. Another opportunity to gather for fellowship and meal and hear about another ministry opportunity. Our craft group is back. They will start on Thursday at 10 a.m., right here in our fellowship hall. If you're interested in participating in crafts and doing work around that wonderful kind of stuff in preparation for our annual craft sale, contact Ann Baker or the church office, and we can see you on Thursday at 10 here in the building. And finally, a reminder that our Monday night Bible study just started back up with a study of Romans. It's been a long 13-week study. They have only had one. You're always welcome to come and join them for a Monday night, whether you're there for the series or just for one particular evening, they would love to have you. 7.30 here in the building or on Zoom. If you need the Zoom link, contact the church office or Brian Masiak to get that information. Let us have a time of prayer, and then I will invite Joe up to lead us in our call to worship and our scripture reading this morning. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, we give you thanks for the ability to gather this morning. We give you thanks for our physical space and for our digital space, for the ability for your word to be heard by many people wherever they might be this morning. Lord, I pray that your spirit would move in a mighty way in each one of our hearts and that we would be drawn closer to you by all that you have for us this morning. We pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please join me in the call to worship. Let us open our hearts to God. God, give us wisdom. By your spirit, God, let us be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. God, give us discernment. May our hearts, minds, and souls be yoked to Jesus Christ through the grace and love given to us. God, God give, give us, us the will, will to be faithful and the power to love as we are loved. Amen. Amen. This morning's reading is from Proverbs 1, verses 1 through 7. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance, for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord is beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand as you are able in this space and join us at home in our opening hymn, Be Thou My Vision.
may be seated, or you can keep standing if you really want to keep standing. We are this morning entering into a brand new sermon series we are calling Life Hacks. It's a sermon series throughout the month of August, and I'm excited for this because I think this series, although it's a brief four-week series, is going to be a series that can make a real impact in your lives and in my life. For the next four messages as we go through this series, I believe this could be the kind of series that really does change the trajectory of your fall and of our entire rest of our year and into the new year. And so I would encourage you as we go through this series to really dig in and to dive in to what is being taught. Uh, As fall comes in, we mentioned a few minutes ago, as kids get ready to go back to school, as teachers get ready to go back to school, Routine starts up again, but certainly we get more and more busy as the fall returns. And so this series is going to be about how do we navigate life in a way that honors God? And how do we navigate in that way and learn what God would have us do? What makes us feel like we are living our lives in line with what God has intended? Now I'll ask you this morning, have you ever had a 24 or 48 hour period of life, just a day or two, where you feel like there's got to be a better way to do life than what I'm living right now. Life shouldn't be this hard. Those days where things just pile up and go nuts and you have no idea how you got where you are. Maybe you've had a day like that or a week like that or a month like that. Maybe even a 19 month period like that, like the time of COVID in the last year and a half. Life is, doesn't seem like it's being lived in the way that it was intended to be. Maybe that's the question. Maybe it feels like we're working against the tide of life and not working with how we were intended to live life. Maybe, we, maybe I feel like I can do something about this. Maybe there's a life hack that would make this easier and make it simpler. Maybe there's something simple that I could do that would change things and make life just so much easier. Now, how many of y'all have heard of life hacks? Have y'all heard of life hacks? Okay, they've gotten more popular the last several years on social media and on the internet. And basically, life hacks are this. They are techniques or strategies that you implement into your life that make life more efficient and more effective. Make kind of shortcuts, if you will, in life. Simple things that make a big difference in the convenience and enjoyment of life. Now, I'm going to share a few of those with you this morning to kind of set the mood for this series And I will tell you before I begin, you are welcome for every single one of these that I am going to share with you. It will change your life. The first one is this, as we are in August and people are out having barbecues and picnics and all kinds of stuff, if you have a cooler full of cold beverages, I hate Coke, I don't know why I chose Coke, but if cold beverages and the ice just won't stay cold, the drinks won't stay cold, add salt to your cooler. If you add salt to the ice, it will make the ice colder and last longer. You're welcome. If you have little ones, grandkids, or kids, if you take those little freeze pops and you store them upright, when you go to cut it, you won't lose any of the popsicle. If you have little, little kids, you can fold them in half and drape them over a a rack, and you can have two for the price of one. You're welcome. I wish I had known this when I was at the beach two weeks ago. Have you ever had loose buttons, buttons that come off on a shirt or on a jacket or a sweater? 
If you put clear nail polish over top of that button, those button strings will stay in place and you won't ever lose another button. You're welcome. And for all the gentlemen watching, the next time you are bothered to go clean a bathroom or a kitchen that you have no desire cleaning, think about this. Anything attached to a drill makes an efficient scrubber. Have some fun with the cleaning while you're at it and clean faster. Some of these, they, they blew my mind like the popsicle one. I don't know why I never thought about that, right? But I, I feel like I've been doing something wrong my entire life when I see things like that. But sometimes when we slow down in life and we realize that some of these things we've just missed, they're not really groundbreaking, they're just we missed something really obvious. Some of the ways we've been living, we've just made it harder for ourselves. We've been working against life as opposed to with it. And I would posit to you this morning as we begin that maybe God has put together life in such a way that if we were to change just a few little things, we might begin to find life being more efficient, more effective, more fulfilling. And for too many of us in this room and online this morning, we walk around with this low-grade frustration just below the surface of everything that we do because of all the things we experience that we feel like have made our life difficult. And maybe the problem isn't loose buttons on a sweater or it isn't popsicles that aren't frozen properly. Maybe it's the bigger stuff. Maybe it's parenting. Maybe it's grandparenting. Maybe it's jobs. Maybe it's finances. Maybe it's addictions, hurt, pain, the real deep things in life. But even in those things, God has given us direction to be able to live our life in such a way that it might change everything. How many times, if we are truly honest with ourselves, as we've been going through life, one of the reasons we feel like we're frustrated is because of decisions we have made or decisions we haven't made that we should have made. Maybe life doesn't have to be as hard as it seems. Maybe there are some things that we could be doing that would make things better. And yet God has offered us all kinds of life hacks throughout the scriptures. And here is the essence of today's message. If we just started to do some of the little things that we already have read about, that we already know about, it would change and transform our lives. Specifically, we're going to be in this series, we're going to spend a lot of time in the book of Proverbs. We can find some of the greatest hacks of all time in the book of Proverbs and unlock an entire new way, a new trajectory for life as we go through this series. Now, if you're not familiar with it, the book of Proverbs is a book uh, that is found in the Old Testament. And it's one of uh, the books that is a book called a book of wisdom, wisdom literature in the Jewish tradition. It is packed full of wisdom. And you have multiple writers who contributed to the wisdom in this book, but the biggest writer that contributed, the vast majority of the book, is King Solomon. And if you've been in church at all in your life, you know that King Solomon was considered one of the wisest, smartest people who's ever lived. And the book of Proverbs is a collection of wise sayings and thoughts and pieces of wisdom all put together in this one book. Now, I will tell you this, this book would have been used in its original form in a school setting. You would have had young men who were learning to become rabbis, learning to become leaders in their community, and they would have this book read to them as a way of teaching them wisdom. So sometimes you'll see in Proverbs, you'll, it'll say, Son, listen to your father. Listen to these words of advice. And it's being taught and drilled into them. And so often these leadership figures, they're saying, listen to your elders. Listen to what I have to say and apply it to your life. So we get 31 chapters in Proverbs. And all 31 of these chapters, they have nothing to do with your IQ, your high school GPA, thanks be to God, or any other marker of intelligence. They have to do with taking what is taught and applying it. It's about doing the right things with the things that you've learned. It's not about what you know, it's how you use what you've been taught. It's information applied. The book of Proverbs is just chock full of this stuff. The first nine chapters, the writers, over and over, and over again, they kind of riff on this one theme. There are two women, one who represents folly and one who represents wisdom. And basically those first nine chapters convince us that whoever's reading or hearing convince us that we would never want to make the foolish choice because the wise choice makes so much more sense. And then in starting in chapter 10, we get the rest of the book of Proverbs telling us all these wise things that we 
clearly want to choose to do. It's kind of like a, uh, the book of Proverbs. You could read it easily in these next five weeks. Read a few chapters a day. They're not very long. I look at Proverbs kind of like a multivitamin. That you take a multivitamin every morning. Like, read a few Proverbs every morning. You'll do better in life if you begin to learn these and apply them. And the ultimate piece, this ultimate life hack that we find in the book of Proverbs comes to us in chapter 9. We also read about it in chapter 1 when Joe read scripture earlier this morning. And we're going to sit on this first verse of chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse 9. It says this, it says, Instruct the wise, and they will be wiser still. Teach the righteous, and they will add to their learning. Instruct the wise, and they will what? They will be wiser still. How many of us within our lives have convinced ourselves at some point, at one time or another in our life, that we have arrived, that we know everything there is to know in this life. I'm way smarter now than I was then, therefore I'm good. But I'll tell you this, that no matter how much knowledge you gain, no matter how wise you are, it says it right here in Proverbs, you can be wiser still. There's always more information out there. There's more understanding out there. In fact, scientists tell us that researchers, that until, from the beginning of history until the year 1900, the collective human knowledge doubled approximately every century. Every century, the entirety of human knowledge doubled up to 1900. From 1900 on, that number, knowledge doubled every 25 years. Knowledge doubled. Scientists tell us that now in the 21st century, the collective human knowledge doubles every 13 months. Every 13 months, humankind doubles its knowledge. You know what that tells me? No matter how much I think I know, there's more to know. Even if I know everything that could be known today, tomorrow there will be more to know. No matter how long you've been a follower of Jesus, whether it's five minutes or 55 years, no matter how long you've known the scriptures, there's more to know. No matter how long you parent, there's more to know. We never actually arrive in terms of wisdom. So Proverbs says, instruct the wise and they will be wiser still. And then verse 10 says this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For through wisdom your days will be many and, your e and years will be added to your life. Because of wisdom, because of this information applied in our life, there will be a positive outcome. Years, days will be added to your lives. It's not just about IQ or information, it's about application. Everyone who's grown up in church, chances are you have heard a sermon on every topic conceivable, probably more than once. But that doesn't mean that we know it all. Most of us hear a sermon and by Monday morning we've totally forgotten what we heard. The difference between information and wisdom is do we apply it? This morning I want to argue to you this morning that wisdom is the ultimate life hack. Wisdom is the ultimate life hack. And I would tell you this morning that I believe our culture, and I don't attack American culture, I just world culture is bankrupt on wisdom. We're bankrupt on wisdom. I want you to go, if you don't believe me, I want you to go and read a little bit of news for five minutes. Go watch the news, pick a channel of your choice, watch the news for one hour and then turn it off. You'll very quickly learn that we are bankrupt on wisdom. See, the first question we ask in the 21st century is never the wisest choice. We might ask, what's going to get me the most money? What's going to get me the most likes on social media? What would give me the most influence or power in this situation? What's going to get me out of trouble the quickest? What's going to make me the happiest? And when we start with those kind of questions, rather than what is the wisest choice, we'll always find ourselves with this low-grade frustration I was talking about. Feeling like we're working against life and not with life. Because God has put together the world, friends, in a certain kind of way. It may, maybe even now as I'm talking this morning, you can think about one situation or one instance in your life where you are so frustrated because you're just banging heads with the way that God designed the world, the way wisdom would want us to go. Proverbs 4, 6 and 7 says it this way, Do not forsake wisdom and she will protect you. 
Love her and she will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is this, and I love this. The beginning of wisdom is get it. It's that simple. No matter what you have, get more wisdom. It's that important. And it goes on to say that no matter what it costs, give up everything you have to get wisdom. Wisdom is that important. I think for too many of us in this world, we have lost all that we have because of a lack of wisdom. If you want wisdom, it's worth the cost of anything you could pay or anything you could give. Otherwise, your life is going to be out of order because wisdom is not why you're making choices. Proverbs 1, 7, we heard it earlier, says again, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's where wisdom starts. It starts with the fear of the Lord. Now, many of you might say that that seems like a terrible life hack. Fear of the Lord sounds terrible, but we're going to talk about why it's actually not that bad. But before we do that, I, I make a disclaimer. I am terrible at math. Anybody out there terrible at math? A yeah. few people, bad at math? Now I'm a preacher, I don't have to be. I can count to 200, I can tell you how many people are in a room. When I was a youth director, I could count kids in the van. That doesn't require a calculus. I'm good, I, I got it under control. But I've never been good at math. I've always struggled with math. And it's just the way my brain is wired. I met a friend of mine named Justin. I never would have passed pre-calc and trig my last math class in high school. That would have been the end of the road, but he helped me and got me through that. But if I look back in my life, I realize there's a moment when I, where it all kind of went wrong. Why I struggled with math even worse than I probably should have struggled with it. I went from private school to public school for fourth grade, and I had entered into this new public elementary school. And I was doing fine, everything was good. And then they gave us an assessment test to say, let's find out placement test, I think is what they called it. Teachers would know that. And through this placement test, they said, you know what? We don't think the basic curriculum is challenging. We're going to put you in this new accelerated program called the gifted program. And I'm like, that sounds pretty good to me. You're calling me accelerated and gifted? I'm all for that. Let's go. And so the next week, I started this new program. And within a very few days, I realized I was in over my head. You see, everybody in that room, I realized, every kid in that room, except for me, knew how to do multiplication tables. They already knew how to do it. I had no clue. And literally, we'd have this time every day where we would go into groups and we'd go through flashcards, uh, memorization, uh, multiplication table flashcards. We'd sit in circles and we'd go around them. And I very quickly realized I had none of the answers and everybody else had the answer. So you know what I did? I learned to memorize the cards. I figured out real quick, if that card says these two numbers, the answer is this. I never learned how to do the multiplication. I just memorized the cards. And within a week, man, I was flying. They thought I had gotten it. But I never figured out how to achieve that math. I just learned numbers in my head. The same is true, I think, for many of us in church. We have lost the ability. We hear things in church. We hear things in Sunday school. We read things in the Bible. But it just gets committed to memory and we don't ever actually learn how to do what it's telling us to do. Proverbs chapter 9 says uh, once again that the foundation, of, the fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. It's a foundational piece. It's the most important part. It's the main thing. Fear the Lord. That is the beginning of wisdom. But many of us, we, have just, we hear the word fear and we, we just give up. We see it on paper but we don't live it out. We really don't know why we're doing what we're doing. We don't understand the purpose of what we're doing. And in all of that, we miss out on the wonderful things like what it means to fear God. But you see, fear God is not about being paralyzed or shimmering in a corner, afraid that God might smite us. That's not what fear of the Lord means. When the writers of Proverbs wrote this, the fear of the Lord that was the beginning of wisdom the word they're using, it shows up throughout the Old Testament. And the word they're using is yira. I don't know if they roll their R's in Hebrew or not, but yira. It's a fun word. But this word, really what it means more accurately is awe, wonder, or reverence. The fear of the Lord is not about being afraid of God. It is about being in awe of God. In wonder of God. In reverence towards God. Understanding and recognizing the position of God as the creator of the universe versus me who's just one of God's creations. The bigness of God in my own smallness in the grand scheme. 
That's what it means to fear God. And the writers, not only that, they also use the word, when they use this word yira, they often pair it with another word that means to see, the way you see things. And so you put these two words together, and the fear of the Lord really is not about being afraid, it's about being in awe and wonder and reverence towards God in the way that we see things. It changes our perspective. How many of you have ever been on a road trip somewhere and have gone up on a mountain overlook or climbed up something like Old Rag or a similar mountain like that? What happens when you get to the very top of that mountain, that top of that overlook, when you crest it and you walk over that edge for the first time with a group of people? What does everybody do? It's just quiet. It's quiet. Right? Because all of a sudden the things you used to worry about at the bottom of that mountain no longer seem to matter. You see the beautiful, enormous expanse of creation. Your problems are back a few thousand feet behind you in your car or at home. This one view, this thing that you're seeing, this sampling of who God is, brings everything into perspective. But so often in life, we reserve that for mountaintop moments. The same is true if you've spent any time with anybody on their deathbed. Somebody who's staring death in the face. The conversations we have in those situations are so much different than the other conversations we've always had. They're not things about like fantasy football or the NFL or the weather or about 401ks. They're about the priorities of life. When someone realizes and recognizes that they only have a few days or hours to live, they see the world with a new perspective. And that's where the fear of the Lord is. That's where wisdom begins. Fear that awe and wonder and reverence towards God. God is so amazing and so incredible that when we see that wonder and awe and reverence in everything that we do, when we see it through that lens first, God is so amazing. When's the last time you slowed your life down enough and just say, wow, God, wow? When's the last time you looked at your kids or grandkids and just thought, wow, what a gift from God? The last time you were on a lake or at the ocean and just looked out and just like, God, wow, your creation is so incredible. We've lost the art and wonder, the art of being in awe and wonder of God. And in doing that, we've lost the fear of the Lord. And in doing so, we've neglected the foundational element of what it means to get wisdom. No wonder we struggle in life. No wonder we have such a difficult time making good decisions and doing the right things. The foundation is missing the awe and wonder and reverence of God. What's interesting to me in the book of Proverbs is that for so many of us, Proverbs points to, tells us we've been chasing the wrong things. Our priorities are out of whack. We've been after things other than what we should be after. In fact, the writer of the main piece of Proverbs, King Solomon, when God comes to him, when he becomes king and says, I will give you anything you want. Imagine anything you want, I will give it to you. What does King Solomon ask for? Wisdom. Wisdom that I might know the choice to make. Wisdom that I would be able to lead and live with a life towards God. That I would enter into this stream of life that you have put me in, God. And I would live with that stream and not fight against it. That I would be in tune with the way that God wants me to lead and live. That I would not be chasing after things that don't matter. Oscar Wilde, the late 1800s poet and playwright, said it this way. He said, there are only two tragedies in life. One is not getting what one wants, and the other is getting what they want. How many of us have gone after things in life? After certain priorities, promotions, getting married, getting a certain school, to go to a certain school for college or graduate school, getting a certain paycheck or a promotion, and we get there and we look around and just go, there's got to be more than that. This isn't it. That's wisdom. Understanding that is wisdom. It's not about all these other things. The beginning of wisdom is a fear of the Lord and awe and wonder and reverence. And what we need to do, this big wisdom life hack, is to keep the main thing the main thing. To keep the foundation there. To keep the foundation important. That shift in perspective will make a massive shift in how you and I live our lives every day. And if I could give you one more life hack this morning, it would be this. Stop expecting life to behave. 
Stop expecting life to behave because it never will. There are so many folks I come across and I spend time talking with, and if they're honest, they're angry with God because their life has not gone how they envisioned it. Sometimes it's big struggles. It's massive struggles. Sometimes it's mundane struggles. They struggle because life isn't what they thought it was going to be. And how many Christians get frustrated with God because they thought that being a Christian was synonymous with the perfect, beautiful, stress-free life. Yet that's not what we end up with. That can be a hard pill to swallow. But Jesus promised us this. He says it in the gospel. He says, listen, just so you know, you will have trouble in life. It will not go good for you all the time. There will be difficulties and struggles. But he says this in John 16, But do not worry, for I have overcome the world. If you've been in Zoom meetings with me over the last year since we've been here at Buck Hall, you see that on a wooden sign behind me at my desk at home. Because it's a constant reminder that no matter what we go through, Jesus has overcome it. So don't be surprised when life doesn't behave because it was never meant to behave. The book of Proverbs is not meant for us to be a taming of life because we can't tame life. In similar vein, I'll give you some parenting advice, some grandparenting advice as a parent of two little children. This is super helpful. Stop expecting your children to behave. That's it. I watch my two kids fight over the same toy for the fifth day in a row or spill food on the carpet for the fourth time in a day that they weren't supposed to have in the living room to start with. And I had this expectation of what parenting was going to be like, that being a dad was going to be fun and it was going to be rewarding and it was going to be great all the time. I was going to be proud of my kids all the time. And if you're a parent, you know that's just not true. That's not how it works. But here's what I would say. If you're never expecting your children to behave, then you're never actually disappointed. It makes it easy. Lower the bar. But here's the thing. And then when they do something awesome, if the bar is low and they do something awesome, you're like, wow, I'm shy. That's awesome. Good job. Right? But if we take that and we modify it and just apply it to our life, so what if life isn't how you expected it to be? Life wasn't intended to behave. And then when it doesn't behave, you're not disappointed. When we keep that main thing, that all in reverence of God is the foundation instead of our expectations, that's the beginning of wisdom. And when we do that and we look at our life through the lens of God's reverence and God's awe and God's power, you say, maybe I've been expecting something from life, but life just can't deliver. If I come to the realization that happiness I'm expecting from my spouse, they can't do that for me. That's not their job. And trying to expect a certain happiness and joy from your children, and you realize that's not their job either. Or you're expecting your job or your 401k or your bank account or your retirement to make you feel fulfilled and great. The house on the lake, the extra car, all of that, it's not going to make you happy because it wasn't meant to make you happy. It never could do that. Wisdom begins with a fear of the Lord. It may sound depressing to hear me say, lower your expectations and everything will be fine. But I don't think it's a disappointing thing. I think it's a freeing thing. See, the book of Proverbs doesn't focus on keeping us out of trouble. That's not the point of the book. The point is to teach us how to respond when adversity comes. The wisdom we get from God is actually teaching us to say, not why, God. Not why is this happening to me. The question is, what now? How do I respond to this situation? There's an interesting thing, though, that goes on in the book of Proverbs where sometimes it seems to contradict itself. On the surface, the Proverbs contradict themselves. Here's a great example, Proverbs 26. It says this, Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you yourself may be just like him. The very next verse says, Answer a fool according to his folly, or he will be wise in his own way. So which do I do? Do I answer the fool or do I not answer the fool? And the answer is yes. Yes, but there may be times in life where this is the wisest choice. And there may be other times in life where this is the wisest choice. That's why it's so important for us to live our lives in tune with the way that God is working and moving in the world. Because God will help us to discern what the right thing to do is at the right moment. 
We can take all the information we want, but wisdom is applying that information to life. And it becomes this wisdom, this awe, this fear of God, where we listen to everything God has to say. God isn't a consultant. God is setting the direction. See, life is not A plus B equals C. It's not that neat and tidy. It's not black and white. Life doesn't play by the rules. But God has given us this pieces of wisdom to help us live it out each and every day in whatever circumstance we find ourselves. But I'll be honest with you, even after all that I've already said, it can still feel like I'm living life putting together a puzzle, a jigsaw puzzle, without the picture. Like, I see the colors, I kind of see the scheme, but I'm not quite sure where everything goes. And if we're honest, that's where so many of us live our lives. But there's one final piece of information, I think, that can change that. That can be the puzzle box lid, if you will. And it comes in the Gospel of John, chapter 1. The writer of John says this, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and of truth. Now the word is capitalized. Who is the writer of John referring to? Jesus. Jesus was the word. He made his dwelling among us. And here's what this verse says to me in the context of what we're talking about. The writer of the book of John, he says that when the word became flesh, what he's saying is all the collective wisdom of the psalmists and of the proverb writers and of all the prophets and the teachers in the Old Testament all of that wisdom literature that had been written down and recorded and talked about. When Jesus shows up on the scene, Jesus shows us what all of that wisdom looks like in the flesh. Jesus is the personification of wisdom. So if you want to know how to live your life, if you want to know what that means, look no further than the very Son of God. If you want to know the way we should live our lives, look no further than the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He is our example. He's the lid to the puzzle box. He shows us what our life should look like. Because that's, here's one of the things that I'm convinced of. Jesus didn't come just to save us. He certainly came to save us, but he didn't come just to save us. That was not the only purpose. Jesus came to show us what it means to live a human life and what it means to live it well. He came to demonstrate what sacrificial love looks like. He came to demonstrate the way that we should teach people and love people and treat people. He came to show us what our priorities should look like. He is the example. So friends, perhaps the frustrations that we have within our lives the grind that we feel too often is because we're working against the stream of life and not working with what God has for us. And Jesus is the example. Jesus is the pace setter. If we exemplify our life after him, it would change everything. Because here's what Jesus says in John 10. Jesus says, A thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I say this often, friends, but I, I don't know about you, that's what I want. I don't want the evil one to get in and to steal and lie and take and kill. I want what God has for me. And when I find myself working upstream, working against the stream of life, when I find myself neglecting wisdom, then I find myself in the first part of what Jesus said. But when I hear Jesus, when I have that awe and reverence of God, when I see Jesus... When I live my life that way, I experience that full, abundant life. And it is life that you and I have all been given. It's a gift. And it's time, I believe, for you and I, as we enter into this series and into this new, next normal, whatever this looks like, to take our wisdom from God, to remember the foundation of that wisdom, the awe and reverence of God, to take that wisdom, take that knowledge, apply it to our lives and just maybe see where it might take us. Friends, we might be shocked at what an amazing life hack that is for us. Let us pray. Father God, I'll be the first one to confess that I, too often I don't listen to the wisdom you give us. I don't always live it out. 
And I think that applies to so many of us. We don't exemplify the kind of life that Christ exemplified in Scripture. But show us, God. Help us to discern where we should do one thing or another. And God, I pray for every person who's in this room and watching online. For all those who feel that their life is a bit frustrated, like they're in a grind and they don't know where to go or what to do. I pray for each and every one of those, God. I pray for your mercy and for your grace within their lives. I pray that we would all begin to live every day in awe and wonder and reverence towards you. And I pray that that would be the beginning of wisdom for us, God. That we would do what you have called us to do. That we would take that knowledge and apply it to our life and that it would change and transform everything. God, thank you for the love of Jesus. Thank you for the peace that he brings us in our life. And thank you for helping to show us the way. God, we lay our hearts before you. Change our hearts. Transform our lives. We pray all these things in your high and holy name. prepare to come to the table. I remind you, as I always do, for those of you who are here in person, that this is not my table, it is not Buck Hall's table, it is God's table, it is Christ's table, and all are welcome to eat at this table. For those of you who are at home, we invite you to go through the liturgy with us and the prayer for spiritual communion. For those unable to be with us in person will be on the screen while the folks in the room are coming to receive communion. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who earnestly love him, all who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and before one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love, we have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. 
free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Blessed are you, our Alpha and Omega, whose strong and loving arms encompass the universe. For with your eternal word and Holy Spirit, you are forever one God. Through your word, you created all things and called them good. And in you we live and move and have our being. When we fell into sin, you did not desert us. You made covenant with your people Israel and spoke through the prophets and teachers. In Jesus Christ, your word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and of truth. And so with all your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. As a mother who tenderly gathered her children, you embraced a people as your own. You filled them with a longing for peace that would last and a justice that would never fail. In Jesus' suffering and death, you took upon yourself our sin and death and destroyed their power forever. You raised from the dead Jesus Christ, who now reigns with you in glory, and poured out upon your church the Holy Spirit, making us the people of your new covenant. On the night on which he was betrayed, Jesus sat in that upper room with his friends, who he knew and who he loved, and who he knew were about to desert him, and betray him, and run. And yet he gave thanks to God and he gave him the bread. He said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, when the supper was over, he took the cup. Again, he gave thanks to God and he gave it to those gathered around and said, take and drink. This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for the world for the forgiveness of sin. Poured out so that all of God's children might come to know his love and his grace. Thanks be to God. On the day on which you raised Jesus from the dead, he was recognized by his disciples in the breaking of the bread. In the power of your Holy Spirit, your church has continued in the breaking of bread and sharing of the cup. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice and union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim together the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Let us pray. Father God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here this day and on these gifts of the field and the vine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we might be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, O God, make us one with Christ, make us one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes again in final victory, and we feast together at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Those of you who are in the room will be invited to come forward and receive an element of prepackaged communion. I invite you to take that back to your pews. Once everybody has received, we will consume them together as one body. For those of you at home, once again, you are invited to pray the prayer of spiritual communion that will be on your screens in just a moment. The table is prepared.
Come and taste and see that our Lord is good. is the body of Christ broken for you. Thanks be to God. This is the cup of Christ, the blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be to God. As we prepare to head out this morning, a reminder that the ultimate life hack, the foundational life hack for all the other life hacks that are to come and for everyday living in our life is wisdom of God. As the proverb says, so important is the wisdom of God, the first thing you need to do is get it. Get the wisdom of God. And how do we get the wisdom of God? What's the foundation? The fear of the Lord. The awe and reverence of and recognizing the glory and power of God in every day of our lives. May it not just be a Sunday morning thing, but a 24-7, 365 thing. And friends, if we recognize the awe and power and majesty of God in everything we see, if we see that in everything we do, it will transform who we are and make it that much easier to swim in the stream of life that leads us to abundant life. Go in the grace and the peace and the love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May the power of the Holy Spirit be with you now and with you always. Amen.